I want to start by reading some scripture from the book of Acts chapter 3, and I'm going to read the first 10 verses in Acts chapter 3. It says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Verse three, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John, Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly, somebody say instantly, instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong and he jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I love this passage. I love this part. They recognized him as the same man who used to sit Begging. Oh, I love that. Look at somebody and tell them, don't ever get used to who I used to be. Come on, tell somebody, don't ever get used to who I used to be. That's what I want to preach today. I want to preach a message titled, but that's who I used to be. That's who I used to be. Say it out loud. But that's who I used to be. Come on, say it again. But that's who I used to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. My my past has not been perfect. But that's who I used to be. Come on, help me out. I, I thought some things that I shouldn't have thought, but that's who I used to be. I said some things that I shouldn't have said, but that's who I used to be. I did some things that I shouldn't have done, but that's who I used to be. How many are grateful that God changes the human heart? There's some things in my life that I'm ashamed of, but that's who I used to be. I've hurt some people in my life deeply, but that's who I used to be. I've, I've, I've cheated some people. I've done, I've done some people dirty, but that's who I used to be. I, I'm not the same anymore. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm not the same anymore. I'm not the same anymore. Ever since I had an encounter with Jesus Christ, I, I'm not the same anymore. I don't think the way I used to think. I don't talk the way I used to talk. I don't act the way I used to act. I'm not, I'm not trying to say I'm perfect. Listen, I may not be everything that God wants me to be today, but thank God I'm not who I used to be yesterday. I'm not who I used to be. I'm thankful that God is in the business of changing lives. And my prayer is that by the time God is done changing you, restoring you, healing you, delivering you, that everybody you know is going to be filled with wonder and amazement and like, what has happened to you? That you are not going to be recognizable. You're going to be unrecognizable. Because when you have an encounter with Christ... Next, next Sunday night, we have our encounter service, and, and, and it's a big one. It's a big one. It might be the biggest one that we've done because it's not, it's not the normal service. It's also a live recording for some of our new worship songs. They're going to be going out on all music platforms, you know, Spotify and Apple Music and YouTube and everything, so it's a live recording, but it's also an encounter night. When we were thinking about a name a couple years ago, 
for that specific night, I, I, I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me with that word encounter because I don't want to go to church. I want an encounter with the power of God. I, I don't want to just go sit in a church somewhere and sing songs. I want the presence and the power of God to just absolutely wreck me. I want God to say, look, here's what I'm going to do in your life today. And just God destroy me. I want an encounter with God. I want an encounter because what God can do in one second can change your life forever. What God can do in one moment, the Bible says, and instantly, and instantly his, his ankles became, and instantly, that's how fast, that's how fast God can change your life. And I'm thankful that I'm not who I used to be. I'm thankful that y'all aren't who you used to be. I'm thankful that, that God is a God of grace and mercy and that God is changing me, that God has changed me, but that God is still changing me. I'm not who I used to be. You know what that means? I'm not who I used to be. I'm going to give you a few thoughts on what it means. I'm not who I used to be. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. It means that I am made new. I am new. I am new. I am brand new. When, when, when I come to Christ, I'm brand new. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let, let's read this out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I love that so much because I have experienced this firsthand. I have lived through this scripture. I have lived. If anyone is in Christ, I remember I didn't used to be in Christ. I wasn't a believer. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't in Christ. If anyone is in, is in Christ, he's a, he's a new creator. I've lived this verse out. I've, I've experienced his first hand being made new again. He, he, he says he is a new creation. Let, let's break this verse into three phrases here. He says he is a new creation. You are a new creation. What does that mean? What does it mean if you are made new? What does it mean if you're a new creation? What does that mean for the rest of your life? What does that mean for your marriage? What does that mean as a father? What does that mean as a mother? What does it mean as a friend? It means that New life is being breathed into your marriage. It means that new life is being breathed into your family, into your family's bloodlines. It means that new life is being breathed into your friendships. You're a new creation. He says, the old has passed away. This is my favorite part of the verse. The old has passed away. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the old being gone forever. It, it means that I'm forgiven. The old is passed away. The old me, that was the old me. Look at your, look at your friend today. And say, that was the old me. That was the old me. That was the old me. You, you, your, your friend says, what do you mean? That was just last night. Yeah, but still, that was the old me. That was the old me. Last night, that was still the old me. I'm a, I'm a new creation. It's been 12 hours. I'm a new man. I'm a new woman. The old me, it means that I'm, it means that I'm forgiven. It, it, it means that I'm free. It means that I'm finally free. It means that I'm forever free. Listen, if God sets you free, don't go back to bondage. I'm going to remain free. I'm forever free. I love this verse because it, it, it's such imagery in my own, my own mind, but it's Psalm 103. 
And it's verse 12, it says that God has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's, that's, that's far. He, he's removed our sins from the, from the, as far as the east is from the west. Right? There's another scripture in Micah, and it says, He takes our sins, our transgressions, and throws them into the depths of the sea. That's good stuff. If God throws your sins in, to the depths of the sea, don't go fishing, trying to pull them back out, right? There's another scripture in Hebrews that says, I remember your sins no more. That's good, y'all. Look at somebody and tell them, I wish you were like that. I wish you were like that. I remember your sins no more. It, it, it means that the old is passed away. The guilt is gone forever. The shame, it's gone forever. The old is gone. It's gone. It's gone. God makes us new again. Have you heard the scripture in Isaiah 43? Oh, it's a good one. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell. We like to dwell, don't we? Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. See, I'm doing a new thing. Hey, forget about that. Man, I know, I know, I know you messed up. I know you blew it. I know you shouldn't have, but you did, but it's fine. Move on, move forward. Don't dwell on the past. God is doing a new thing. God can't move you forward into the new thing if you're still walking backward into the old thing. I'm doing a new thing. A new thing. A new thing. Paul said, he said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I, I, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. God makes us brand new again. I, I can't, I, I can never repay my good God for making me new again. He, get, he gives me a new heart. He gives me a new spirit. No more looking back. Paul is speaking. Listen, Paul is speaking from firsthand experience. You know what firsthand experience means? It means that you've lived through it and you now have a testimony. You can't tell me if if it didn't or did happen. You can't tell me if it's true or not because you didn't live through it. It's my testimony. It's my story. You can look at me and say, I don't know. You don't know because it's my story. It's my testimony. Paul lived through it. He had firsthand experience. Can you imagine Paul a non-believer, a non-Christian, not a Jesus follower. In fact, he was so against it that he's persecuting Christians, imprisoning Christians, going door to door, and dragging Christians out to put them in prison. It's not that he just didn't believe. It's that he was trying to kill it. It's not that he just didn't believe in Jesus. He was trying to squash anybody that did to suppress the message, to suppress the word. Paul the persecutor, Paul the, the God that we serve would take Paul the persecutor and turn him into Paul the preacher? Like, are you kidding me right now? That his grace is that sufficient. That his mercies are made new every morning, not some mornings, but every morning. Paul saying, I know I, I put people like y'all in prison. I watch people get killed because they were Christians. I was in the circle. I was standing there when Stephen was stoned to death because of his faith in Jesus Christ. I should have done something about it. I didn't do anything about it. Paul said, I'm the chief of all sinners. And he says, not only am I the, but, but listen, I have been set free. I have been made new again. I have been made brand new. I know the feeling. I know the feeling of grace and forgiveness. 
I know the feeling. I, I, I love this scripture in Galatians chapter one. I don't know if you've ever read these verses in verses 11, 12, and 13, but I want to read to you. These are the words of Paul, and he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it. This is crazy. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Verse 13, for you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism and how intensely I persecuted the church of God and I tried to destroy it. I, I, I tried to destroy it. I did not receive it from any man. This is, this is the part that gets me right here. Somebody needs this today. He said, I didn't, I didn't receive this from any man. Uh, the, the, I wasn't taught this by a human being. I, I received this from, from God. It was a divine revelation. Look, this is important because, man, man, there's a lot of great preachers, man. We got, we got Pastor Darrison. He can preach the paint off the wall. He can rip the roof off the ceiling. He's a great preacher. I'm sure there were so many great preachers in Paul's time. He goes, I didn't discover this through a preacher. I didn't, I wasn't sitting in the bishop's church. I wasn't sitting under, a, I was in the middle of the desert on my own. And I had a divine revelation. See, I need this right now. Maybe this one's just for me because God does not need a man or a woman. He does not need a human being to change a life. God is not limited to human resources. And here's why it matters to me. Because I got some family members who are wandering in the wilderness. And I'm like, God, send them, an, send them a messenger. Send them a preacher. God, send them somebody that will tell them. Send them somebody that will knock some sense to them. And God said, Travis, I'm not limited to human resources. I will do it when I want to do it. I will do it. I will do it by divine revelation. By divine revelation. And Paul said, I didn't receive it from a man. He's on the road to Damascus. The Bible says in the book of Acts. He's en route to persecuting more Christians. He's en route. His mission was to shut the gospel down. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm on my mission when all of a sudden the power of God, an encounter with God, knocks me to the ground and a bright light shines and it blinds me. I become blind. And then God starts speaking audibly from the heavens. That would be cool. Yeah. Or scary. <laughs> Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And this was the moment. This was the divine encounter. Paul experiences the most radical conversion experience and goes from being a persecutor to a preacher. He goes from walking this way to walking that way, from darkness to light, from death to life. Isn't that what we're all celebrating today? So Paul is speaking from firsthand experience. He's saying, I am a new creation. The old me is gone. The old me is gone and the new, the new has come. The new has come. Yeah, that's worth giving Jesus a round of applause for. The new has come. I'm not who I used to be also means number two. It means this. It means I'm given a new heart. I'm given a new heart. I'm not who I used to be. I'm new and I'm given a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, and I will give you a new heart. 
This is God talking. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Have you ever heard that we call God the great physician? Yeah, he's the great physician. We've, we've got a lot of good physicians in the world. we got a lot of good physicians in Scottsdale. But you're not a great physician. I only know one great physician. You might be a good physician, but you're not the great physician. God is the great physician. He's a, he's a heart surgeon. See, God's, God's able to do heart transplants. He takes out the old and he puts in the new. Why? is a new heart. Why is it even important? I want to give you four reasons. It's important. Why is a new heart important? It's important because our hearts become hard. Our hearts become hard, cold, calloused, desensitized. Jesus said in Matthew 13 for this people's heart, that their hearts have become Calloused, they hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. They're calloused. Otherwise, they might be able to see with their eyes or hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and in turn, I would heal them. If they could just see, if they could just hear, they'd, they'd turn from what their wicked ways are. If they could just see and hear, but they can't see and hear because their hearts are hard. See, this is what a calloused heart does is it closes your eyes. A a calloused heart, it closes off your ears. Your ears are closed. So what God's trying to tell you, what he's trying to say to you, I'm callous, so I can't can't hear. God's been talking. He's talking. He's talking. I can't hear him. My, My heart is hard. My eyes are closed. He's trying to show you things, but your heart, it's become hardened and calloused and cold and desensitized. And, and a heart, a heart becomes calloused over time. Gradually. Gradually. It becomes callous Gradually. Right? Does anybody, does anybody work out? Raise your hand. If you work out, stand up. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna see if you work out or not. We're gonna judge you. If you, if you work out, stand up. If you don't work out, don't lie. You fry, you're in church. You just stay seated, you lazy. If you work out, if you work out, let's give a round of applause for all of our workouters. All right, you can sit. I'm done embarrassing you. I, I work out like it's, it's, I accidentally fell into getting fit. I did. I, I, I had a stroke, and pre-stroke, November of 2022, I did not believe in working out. I thought it was of the devil. Post-stroke, I'm into physical therapy and I'm doing physical therapy for six months and then I graduated into like a trainer and working out and now I'm a year and a half out and like if I don't work out, dude, my day's messed up. I work out. And I work out like I preach. I ain't playing around. Like we're gonna freaking lift the whole roof off this place. That's how I work out. I I got calluses all over my hand. Big, thick ones. Oh, yeah. Like a mason. Not a mason, religiously, but like a... <laughs> a, a carpenter. Thanks for the word. Yes, a carpenter. I got these calluses, but I didn't get them overnight. I got them gradually. Anybody play guitar? Anybody play guitar? Even a little bit. You can play a chord. You can play a note. Play a little guitar. You get calluses. You get calluses from playing guitar, but you don't get calluses instantly. It it takes time. 
See, see one, of, one of the strategies that the devil uses on you and me is he, he uses the gradual slowness of time to callous your heart so that you don't even realize it's happening until it's already happened. And now you go, man, my heart is hard. My heart is hard. It's now calloused. It happened little by little. I didn't even notice it. It didn't jump from zero to 100. It it happened slowly. It was slowly. And and what used to shock me, what used to shock me, what used to shock me is now no big deal. What used to, it used to put fear, it is now normal. What I used to say, I would never do that. Now not only do I do it, but I, I, I lead other people into doing it. it it's gradual. It's, but, but listen, here's the scariest part about a hard heart, a callous heart, a desensitized heart, is not only do you become desensitized to the pollution of the world, you also become desensitized to the pureness of God. Because my heart is hard. My heart has become callous and I'm numb to what God is even trying to do in my life. I don't even feel him. I don't recognize him. I don't hear his voice. I don't see his signs. The conviction I used to feel, I I no longer feel it. Oh man, I, I pray God. Don't ever let me not feel conviction. I need to feel that. I don't like it, but I need it. I need to feel. I need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. I need you, God, to say, Travis, you can't do that. Travis, you can't say that. You can't say that like that. You can't do that. God, don't let me ever not feel the conviction. See, a hard heart can't feel it anymore. It's numb, desensitized. But thank God, we have a great physician who gives us a new heart. And he replaces our heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Why is a new heart important? It's important because our hearts become hard. And number two, because our hearts become dirty. Dirty. No no amens on that one. Our hearts become dirty, polluted, right? They they, they become filthy. And just like a hard heart, a filthy heart happens gradually. It just slowly, I I remember it in in like middle school. I was a part of this, uh, I don't know what it was, but it was called D.A.R.E., I don't even know what it stands for. But it was something about the police department program and drugs. That's all I remember. It was like 100 years ago, so it's hard to remember. But I remember in middle school, I will never, ever drink alcohol. I will never smoke weed. Ever. Never. Never. No, my position was I, I will never do it. Your position doesn't have to be mine. We need to have the same biblical position. But, but, but my position is my whole family bloodline on both sides are all addicts. My, my mom's sister died of a heroin overdose. Her other sister died of drugs. My cousin died of a heroin overdose. Alcoholism runs rampant through my family. I said, I will never drink. I will never do drugs. I will never smoke weed. I will never And then gradually starts to happen. And little by little. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know if there was a day in high school I didn't smoke weed. That's how fast, but yet how slow it happens. Gradually, you get desensitized. Gradually, you go, oh, I would never do that. That's terrifying. And then what the devil uses is your closest friends. And then you start going, well, it can't be that bad. And it lowers your fears. And when your fears get lowered, the right kind of fear, a holy fear, 
That's when you become vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. The holy fear keeps a hedge of protection around our lives, around our heart. A holy fear. Man, I'm going to save myself. I'm not having sex till marriage. Man, you're a man ho. What happened to that? What happened to that? Gradually, that's what happened. Gradually, that's what happened. Little by little, that's what happened. But thank God we serve a God who is the great physician that can give us a new heart, that can give us a clean heart. He can give us a pure heart. Do you remember the story of David? David, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. It's one of the Ten Commandments, everybody. Do not commit adultery. It's one of the big ten. It's like part of the, you know, the Bible ESPN highlights. Dun -dun -dun, dun -dun -dun. The top ten. Do not commit adultery. And I know for anybody in the room today right now, your heart's racing if you're committing adultery. Because there are people that are right now. The Bible is not, a, a, it's not like, oh, what a bummer, that sucks. You mean I can't be banging like five people at the same time? Like, what kind of God do I serve? What a killjoy. Some of y'all, it's your first time at Impact Church and you're like, never again. Never again. <laughs> David commits adultery with Bathsheba, but then he, but then he has this repentive heart. The, there, there's a whole chapter of David's repentance. It's Psalm 51. The whole chapter is like, I cannot believe that I did that. Have you ever felt like that? I cannot believe I did. God, I'm so sorry. God, please forgive me. God, don't let your presence go away from me. I want to read to you because he says in Psalm 51, verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart. My heart's become dirty. It's become filthy, polluted. It's gotten off track. God created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. God, renew me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Listen, maybe today you feel like David. Man, that's a, that's a feeling of failure. That's a feeling of I've let people down. That's a feeling of like I can't believe my own stupid self. That's a feeling of shame. Guilt, regret, it, and maybe that's you today. You, you've become polluted in your heart, filthy. Listen, if that's you today, thank God. We have a God who is the great physician, a God who can make our hearts clean again, a God who can purge our hearts with the power of the Holy Spirit and make our hearts pure again. This is one of the things I love so much about water baptism. We have our next baptism service on the 25th. It's coming two Sundays from today. Over 5,000 people have been water baptized in the ministry of Impact Church. I love water baptism because it is a symbol of new life. It is a symbol of me being buried. The old Travis is dying, and I'm burying that man, and I'm rising up new in Christ Jesus. I'm burying the old me. I, God is washing me clean. He's washed, created me a clean heart. Wash me clean, God. Wash me white as snow. Maybe you've never been baptized. I want to encourage you to get baptized August 25th and join the family of over 5,000 people at Impact Church. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Make that your prayer today. God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Why is a new heart important? It's important because our hearts become hard. It's important because our hearts become dirty. It's also important because our hearts get broken. 
<laughs> hey, we've all suffered from a broken heart. If you haven't, you just haven't lived long enough yet. I've got bad news for you. It's common. Broken hearts. Hearts that get taken advantage of. Hearts that get used. Hearts that get abused. Hearts that are not handled with care and they're dropped and they're trampled on and stomped on. See, here's the problem with the broken heart. A broken heart tends to build up walls. I never want to go through that again. To you, I'm never going through that again. I'm never going to have a broken heart again. And so I build up walls around my heart because now I don't trust now I don't trust. And the problem is, is that in an effort of self-defense, it's actually self-sabotage. Because when we build up walls to keep people out, it also keeps God out. I'm building up walls. I don't trust you. I don't trust you. God might want me to have a relationship with somebody, it might be a God thing, but because of what happened in the past, I don't trust the future. Because he did me wrong, I don't trust you. Because she did me wrong, I don't trust you. God doesn't want us to have a heart that is surrounded by walls. He wants us to have a heart that is repaired and restored by the great physician. A, a tender heart, a heart that feels, a heart that's pure. See, the word says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Come on, somebody should say amen to that. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 147, 3, it says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Why is a new heart important? A new heart's important also because our hearts become deceived. We've all been deceived confused. We, we need a new heart because my old heart becomes deceived, confused. In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9, it says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. Another translation says it's desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The heart is deceitful above all things. Deceitful. I, I always say, you know, the crazy thing about deceit is that people who are deceived don't know they're deceived. That's the power of deception. People who are deceived don't know they are deceived. But everyone around them who loves them knows they're deceived. We just won't listen to them because we're so deceived and so filled with pride that we think we're right. Anybody ever been deceived in here today? You've been deceived, confused. We live in a world today that's deceived. We live in a world that's in a state of confusion, deceived. We live in a world that doesn't know right from wrong or wrong from right. You know what's crazy about that? The word teaches us right from wrong. We have, we have God's voice for our lives that teaches us what is right and what it's not confusing. It might not be what you want to hear. A lot of it's not what I want to hear. But it's the truth. It's not confusing. 
the, 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 what we do is we, we, we treat the Bible, we treat the Bible like it's a buffet. You know what I'm saying? You go to a buffet and you're like, yeah, I'll take me some of that. I'll take me some of that. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yes, sir, I'll take that. Oh, God is more than able, exceedingly abundantly. I'll take me some of that too and I'll put that on my plate. And, 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 then, and, then, and then we go, don't drink to get drunk. Nah, I'm gonna leave that there. I don't want that one. We say, yeah, I agree, I shouldn't murder. That's kind of a bad thing. Thou shalt not murder. Yep, Big Ten, I can see why. But adultery, PT, if you only know, my, hey, my wife, this woman's fine at work. So I'm going to leave that one. I don't want some of that. No adultery stuff. The Bible's not a buffet. The Bible, it's the truth. You may not want to hear the truth. It's the truth. I've been drunk so many times I can't tell you. There's a part of that that's kind of fun. I mean, there's a part of being absolutely trashed. This is a good time. God, how about, how about I can only get drunk once a week? I mean, that would be cool. I mean, you know. Truth is the truth. We just choose to turn parts of it off that we don't like to hear, that doesn't align with how we feel. Thank God truth isn't based on what we feel or how we feel. Thank God truth isn't. Truth is not defined by culture. I'm gonna say it again. Truth is not defined by culture. Truth is not even defined by United States law. Truth is defined by the Word of God. The Word of God is, is it's the voice of God. And it's not a book of bummers. It's a book that will bring you happiness and joy if you walk it out. It is a book of protection. It is a book that will protect your loved ones. It will protect your marriage. It will protect your children. It is a book that is set for us to have boundaries, not to confine us, but to set us free. Amen. To set us free. I've been deceived so many times, I can't even. Deception. Deception. The, the, the Bible says this. I, I can relate to this. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says, They say that what is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right. Anybody feel that? That what is black is white and white is black and what is bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. I don't know. Is that good? Is that not good? I'm confused. I'm deceived. That was me before I met Jesus. Like a warped sense of reality. A warped sense of reality. I didn't know what was right and wrong. I mean, I did, but I convinced myself that I didn't. I would convince myself that what is wrong is really right or at least okay. I would convince myself that what was wrong really wasn't that wrong. And culture doesn't define truth. I've been deceived. You've been deceived. We, I, I, sometimes I like, I wonder what God thinks about us right now as a human race. I wonder what he thinks about his creation. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I'm like, what? I wonder, what, not about, let me, I don't wonder what God thinks about them. I wonder what he thinks about us. Because we're all in this together, right? Like, 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 we've been deceived, man. 2020. We did that. We really did that. We did it. We did 2020 like sheep to the slaughter, man. No questions. Jesus referred to us as sheep, which is not a compliment. They just follow the butt in front of them. <laughs> right off the cliff. 
There's a pandemic, man. I got to get the Fauci ouchie, man. Give me a few of them while you're at it, man. I'm not disrespecting whether somebody got a shot or not. I'm just saying, as a human race, we did all that. My daughter played college basketball. We were just talking about it last week. Mom and dad weren't allowed to go. It's in San Diego. We had to watch on TV. We went to all of her freshman games, and then her sophomore year was COVID. We weren't allowed to go because it was COVID. The gym was shut down. So we had to watch on TV. This is what I saw. I saw my daughter's bench during the game, and all of them have masks on, and they're all sitting six feet apart. <laughs> And then when it's when it their time to check in the game, they took the mask off and they went up and bodied up and breathed all over each other. We did that, y'all. We did that. Some of y'all are old enough to remember Y2K. Yeah, we did that too. For those of you that don't know, there was this rumor that computer software engineers were not smart enough for the computers of the world to move from 1999 to 2000. That was going to shut the globe down. It was going to shut all the computer grids, the electrical grids. We were, we were, we, this was problematic for society. And I mean, I'm like, you know, just in case, I better be ready. <laughs> We're going to need some food, babe, and a lot of it. And weapons of mass destruction. I still got tuna from Y2K. I still eating tuna from Y2K. Tuna's like a cockroach. It lives forever. You're like, PT has guns. Oh, you know it. Hey. You might be my neighbor, but if it comes down to it and you try to come up on my tuna, I'm smoking you from the top of my roof, man. That's for me and my family. Like, we really did that. We did that. Duped. Duped. I mean, how many times can we keep getting duped? Listen, we need discernment discernment. Do you know that discernment is a spiritual gift? It's one of the nine spiritual gifts. Discernment is the mind of Christ. Discernment is seeing a situation the way God sees it. Discernment is seeing a person how God sees that person. Discernment is understanding if this is going to be a good business deal or a bad business deal because God is giving me a supernatural gift to discern. To discern. And the reality is, is that when it comes to right and wrong, let me just say it like this. You cannot, if you're a believer today, you're a Christian, you love Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. If you are a believer, you cannot expect someone who is a non-believer to think like a believer, to reason like a believer. You cannot expect an atheist to understand the way a believer would. Un you cannot expect somebody without the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them to think like somebody with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, it says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are, what's that word say? Discerned only through the Spirit. They, they, 
Not only do they not understand, they consider it foolishness. I'm not a Christian. You're getting baptized? What? You're getting in a bath? Huh? Oh, yeah, you believe some dude died on a cross for you 2,000? They're not going to understand it, and they don't have firsthand experience. They don't yet have a testimony that they have lived through that is living proof. of your savior. So I need a new heart because my heart becomes deceived. It's desperately wicked. It's sick. But thank God, the great physician gives us a new heart and puts a new spirit within me. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be. And that also means, number four, that I'm given a new mind. I'm given a new mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be, what's that word say? Conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may what? Discern. Discern. There's that word again. What is the will of God? What is good and acceptable and perfect? Don't be conformed. We're conformers, like by nature, by human nature. We conform. It's just what we... we We are automatic conformers. He says, don't be conformed to this world. Another translation says, to the pattern of this world. The world always has a pattern. It always, culture is always changing and defining and redefining what's right and what's wrong. What's right today, according to culture, What's wrong today, according to culture, will not be the same 100 years from now. The Bible will remain the same. It's never changing. What's right, what's wrong, has been the same since the scriptures were written. He says, don't be conformed, but be transformed. And and I love this part. He says, by the renewal of your mind. See, the moment the Holy Spirit began to live in me, I, I don't think the way I used to think. I don't comprehend the way I used to comprehend. And I love this part. He says, transformed by the renewing, the renewing of your mind, the renewal of your mind. I'm transformed. My mind is transformed. My way of thinking has been transformed. Listen, it's important to understand because transformation is a process. I want to say that again. Transformation is a process. So, have some grace with yourself. And you're not going to like this part. But have some grace with everybody else. Because it's easy to have grace with ourselves, is it not? But just judge and murder everybody else. Crucify them. Crucify them. Crucify them. It's easy to not be a person of grace. The renewal of your mind, renewing the mind is a process. It is a process. Transformation is a process. I gave my life to Jesus Christ February 20th, 1993. On February 20th of 1993, I wasn't the same person as on February 19th of 1993, but since then, the transformation process still continues. I'm still being changed into the image and the character of God. It's a process, it's a process. We gotta be gracious, people who extend, we we extend some leeway, right? for mistakes.
because it's a process, process. And everybody likes to point fingers at everybody else, but you're no different. In the first few years, I got these two stories. They stand out. First few years of the church. I remember this one time. When the church was smaller, my wife and I, we would stand at the back doors and we'd shake hands of everybody that came to church. Then at a service, we did it again, at a service, at a service. We had five services in the old building, uh, two Saturday, three Sunday. We would stand at that lobby every day. And then when we got here and it just got crazy, it was like, if I stand at that lobby door, I'm going to bottleneck the entire system of bodies moving and cars getting out of here. So, so, so we don't do it uh, anymore. But I remember one time somebody in the church came up to me and they had looked like they seen a ghost. And they were like, P.T., and our band at the time, it was none of these people. It was different characters. <laughs> and some were characters. PT, you're not going to believe it. One of your band members is outside smoking. Just like that. And I went, no way. What are they smoking? She said, cigarettes. And I said, that's progress, baby. Come on, somebody. If he's only smoking cigarettes, God is working. God is transforming that man's life. Then, 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 then there's just one other time. There's one other time. Very similar. PT, did you see what that girl was wearing in the front row? First of all, if you're in the front row, I see what you're wearing. <laughs> PT, do you see what that girl was wearing in the front row to church? And I'm like, she was wearing something? That's progress, baby. Come on, somebody. God's at work. She's getting more and more covered up every week, getting more and more modest every week. Let's let God be the Holy Spirit. And how about you and I get out of the way and let God do what he does? Let God do what he does. He cleans us up. We don't need to clean people up. We can't clean people up anyway. Let God clean us up. Let God clean us up. God cleans the human heart. He can cleanse our soul. Transformation. Man, it's, it's a process. It's a process. I love this scripture in Philippians chapter 1. Paul again, he said, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. God is faithful to complete the work. He is not going to stop working on you. He's not going to stop working on me. It is a process. It's a process. And the fourth thing, I'm not who I used to be. It means that I'm given new eyes. I'm given new eyes. You know the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. I, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was blind. I couldn't see it before. I couldn't see it, but now I can't not see it. I once was blind, but now I see. Now I, now I see. I think it's incredible that Paul's conversion experience, if you want to read it on your own, it's in Acts chapter 9. But in his conversion experience, he's on the road to Damascus. And he gets knocked down by the power and the presence of God. And he gets blinded by this light. And the, and the Bible says he was blind for three days. But he didn't know he was going to be blind for three days. Like if you lose your vision, you don't know if that's going to be forever or not. And if your vision is taken, you know, if something significant is taken from you like your vision it means now you're going to have to trust in something else because I used to trust my eyes but if I can't see I can't trust my eyes and I think it's incredible when you read this story because he was blind for three days 
And God was working in the backgrounds. Hey, listen, today, somebody, you need to hear that. God's working in the background. God's working in the background. You might not see it, but he's working in the background. And God has this prophet named Ananias to pray for Paul to receive his sight back. And the Bible says that, and it's such a vivid picture for me. It's, it's imagery that it's stamped in my, my mind. It says something like scales fell from Paul's eyes. Scales. Something like scales. And I think for me, the imagery is so profound because when I think of scales, I think of snakes. And I think of Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve are in the garden and the, the serpent comes to tempt Eve. And the Bible says that the serpent was crafty. Our enemy's crafty. And think about this for a minute, because it's an interesting thought. The serpent wasn't scary. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the Bible says that the devil masquerades himself like an angel of light. So it's really the devil, but it looks like an angel. You say, well, snakes are pretty scary. Maybe so to most. But the snake just looked like another creature that belonged in the garden. It didn't look misplaced. It's just another creature in the garden. And so it lowers my fears. I wonder how many creatures are in the gardens of your life that look like they belong, but it's really the devil trying to take you down. And it says that the serpent was, was crafty, right? We know the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. We know that the Bible says that his purpose is to steal, is to kill, is to destroy. We know that the Bible says he wants to sift you like wheat. We know that Satan's whole mission is to deceive. We know that he wants to make us see with a warped sense of vision. We know that Revelation 12 says that the devil is the great deceiver. So I think this is so powerful that scales fell and then he could see again because that's what salvation is because some of you today you've got scales on your eyes the scales of sin but God wants to remove the scales so that you can see again so that you could see again that's salvation. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I couldn't see it before, but now I can't not see it. I couldn't see it before. In fact, I saw the complete opposite, but how is it that I saw the opposite, but now it seems so obvious? The scales fell, and he was given new eyes to see not just physically, but eternally. Because now he had not just eyesight, but vision, eternal vision. Now I went from I'm trying to kill the church to I'm going to build the church. And I'm going to give everything I've got. God has corrected my vision. God is the great physician, and praise God, he has corrected my vision. I have had my vision corrected. I see life with new vision. God has given me a clear outlook on life. 
spiritual vision. I see with an eternal outlook. I now see life with optimism and hope. I now see life through the eyes of faith and hope and love. I now see obstacles as opportunities. I now see valleys as passageways to victories. I now see that the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual battle. And I can fight against other humans all I want. Nobody wins. War, nobody wins. Politics, nobody wins. Or I can fight spiritually against the forces of hell under the anointing and the power of God. And God's going to win. God's going to win. God's going to win. Father, I pray today in Jesus' name for everybody here, everybody listening online. Lord, we're grateful for your power. We're grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your word today. God, we're grateful, God, that we are not who we used to be. God, we're not everything that you want us to be, but we're not who we used to be. God, we're thankful. We're thankful that we're in a process of transformation. God, we're thankful that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. God, we're grateful that scripture says, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling in my soul. God, today, we pray that we will not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but that we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Listen, if you're here today, Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're like Paul. Maybe you're like I was. And you say, I'm, I'm not a believer, but here I am. Somehow, some way, I found myself in the middle of this service. I found myself in the middle of this online program where I'm hearing the gospel. Listen, God wants a relationship with you. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Don't you ever forget. God loves you. He created you for a purpose and on purpose. God loves you. He has a plan for you that is so spectacular, that is so special, that is so significant. He wants you to be a world changer, a world changer. And if you're here today and you say, PT, I'm not a Christian yet, I want to invite you to step across the line, to step across in faith with me and say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Jesus, today, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the cross. Lord, thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you for unconditional love. God, I'm a new creation. The old is gone. And the new has come. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. amen. Impact Church, God bless you guys. We love you so much. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.